Throughout the world, military modelers aspire to ever higher standards of detail, accuracy and realism. In this series, expert model craftsmen in their own workshops share their award-winning techniques so that you may benefit from their vast experience. Jeff Ilsley, Chief Judge at the world-renowned Euromilitaire Show, is recognised as one of the world's leading exponents of airbrushed painting. Jeff has broken new ground and has created new techniques which have raised the art of airbrushing to new heights. In this programme, Jeff takes us from choosing and maintaining airbrushes through many of his groundbreaking innovations, including flesh tones, metallics, wood, feathers, camouflage, and even more. So now let's go over to Jeff's workshop. Priming and underpainting of your uh, work is the single most important step before the final finish. The final result on your model will never be better than the uh, priming and the underpainting and undercoating of the piece because the surface final finish is only microns thin and so if your underbase isn't absolute perfection then the final result will look flawed. I'm going to introduce you to a series of primers which I found to be excellent. These are products of Gun Sangyo, which are now available in the UK. And the first that I've selected to use, because I'm about to do a metal figure, is Mr. Metal Primer. Now, white metal is not the easiest of materials to retain a paint surface. It therefore has to be primed with something which will grip the surface uh, before you can undercoat it. Now this material is sufficiently thin that it will not need any further thinning. It is one of the few occasions when you can apply it directly into the airbrush. And it is simply a matter of applying a thin coat over the surface. And instead the the sound that you can hear just then was the compressor cutting in, which has got an automatic switch, and then the pressure goes down and that was it switching off. Make sure you get into the recesses. It is almost instantly drying. Next, the base primer. Like all paints, this needs to be thinned. So, our special thinner. Charge the hopper with some of the diluted primer paint. What I'm trying to achieve is to get the paint into the deepest recesses because those penetrating parts are the most difficult for an airbrush to reach. So start by concentrating on the deep, hard to access parts and then work outwards so that you can then do a nice even job on the features of the face and a nice even final coat. What you'd want to try and avoid is doing that, uh, doing it a nice even face, then realising that you haven't got any paint in the back part, and then attempting to go in and do it, and in the course of it, overpainting, putting too much paint and getting runs on the sides of the face. All of that is now uh, even and thin, and remember that although it's a base coat, it is microns thin, so you're not covering up any available detail from the sculpture. Uh, fortunately this primer dries very rapidly. For subsequent uh, applications on parts which aren't so easy to hold, it's well worthwhile drilling and pinning them so that you can hold the piece uh, entirely without putting your fingers on the artwork afterwards. Uh, these materials are for use on a white metal uh, figure. 
if you have a resin figure, the same company makes the Mr. Resin Primer Surfacer, uh, but after the application of Resin Primer Surfacer, uh, it is still necessary to apply Mr. Base White over the top of it as your pre-final paint coat. One of the untold secrets of airbrushing is the extraordinary capability of artists' oil paint. Uh, many modellers do not realise that oils can be airbrushed and, in my opinion, are amongst the easiest paints of all to use. Uh, I hope to convince you with the application of a Caucasian skin tone colour to uh, the figure of uh, a dancer which was sculpted many years ago by Tim Richards and was uh, re-released under the Metal Models label. Right, my favourite formula for a light-skinned Caucasian skin tone is a combination of white, yellow ochre and burnt sienna. These three colours are the base formula for the majority of skin tones found around the world. By altering the proportion of each of them will create a varied skin aftertone which may be appropriate for the ethnic type that you are modelling. Uh, you can add uh, to the basic mix other tinting colours, uh, dark blue, dark green, in order to achieve uh, a very deep skin tone. If I was uh, modelling an Ethiopian uh, or someone from southern India, I would use a combination of these darker colours with the basic skin colours to give uh, a much deeper tone which is more authentic for their particular skin colour. Taking each of these tubes of oil colour in turn, I'm going to squeeze out a proportion. Uh, next, using a simple palette knife, take a proportion of the white paint and mix into it a small amount of the yellow ochre and a small amount of the burnt sienna and always add a tiny amount of the darker colour to white. Never add white to the darker colour because the tinting properties of these are uh, tremendous and you would end up in short time with half a pound of white paint being needed to lighten the colours to the usable amount that you want to adopt. And you'll see that by mixing in this way with a palette knife, you can see exactly the colour that you're eventually going to get. One of the beauties of oil colour is that it doesn't change its colour when it dries. This is a problem with both enamels and, in particular, acrylic colours which tend to do that. Some dry lighter and some dry darker. With oil paints, what you see is actually what you get. So using the same uh, middle tone paint, separate from it a proportion and put it to one side on the palette. Separate out another portion and put that also to one side. In the case of this uh, part over here I'm going to add some more of the darker colours to make this a dark or shaded skin tone and in the case of the portion that I've put to this side I'm going to add some more white to it simply to lighten it to some degree to use as the light skin tone, but the part in the middle will remain the middle skin tone. I'm now going to take some thinner. This is a xylene based thinner which I uh, quite like because it is quite aggressive as a thinner. But you can use white spirit or even a cocktail of the xylene with the white spirit. I'm going to use an ordinary synthetic brush which has got some bulk to it because I'm going to use it as well to load the airbrush with the mixed and thinned paint. Take a little of the paint off the edge of the blob of paint that I've placed with the palette knife and draw it into the thinner and mix as you proceed. The more time that you spend on this 
thorough mixing will be handsomely repaid with trouble-free airbrushing. I'm now going to load the airbrush to get an initial spray on the figure. Whilst applying a basic overall coverage, I am tending to spray uh, the shaded parts of the human figure when viewed with an overhead light a little more heavily and I'm purposely avoiding the upper parts of the figure or the parts that would be lighted from above in order to use the light tone of skin colour that I prepared in the first place. And then finally I will return to provide with a low angle shot or angle of attack the shaded portions of the figure using the darker tone that I mixed. The other point that I'd like to emphasize is that I'm painting the whole figure. I'm not worrying at all about this uh, vestige of a garment that she's wearing uh, purposely because I want to show you with that one of the great advantages of oil paint when it comes to the final part of the painting demonstration on this figure. I've almost covered with uh, the middle tone all that I really want to do and I want now to pass on to um, the other colours, the deeper and the lighter colour, in order to um, get a little more shading depth and subtlety. I'm now going to recharge the paint uh, hopper with a little of the lighter tone of paint simply to flash over the upper parts of the figure which will catch the light. At the moment there is not much paint on it. Uh, I've avoided using the middle tone on the upper portions but I have got the upper part light tone paint ready for just that purpose. Although I've already got now two layers of paint, the fact that uh, the use of oils means that the paint does not dry. The fact you are also using incredibly thin coatings with just a little drying time whilst I'm talking about it occurring means that you can put subsequent layers on top of the first and because they're so thinly applied there is no running uh, and dribbling and there's no need to wait for hours between each coating. That said, I would stress that the paint itself is incredibly delicate because it will remain static, it will remain capable of being spoilt by the slightest physical touch. So always keep this uh, in mind when you're handling the piece. The other thing to remember is to pay attention to the extremities of the figure. Uh, it's very easy to forget to do the ends of the arms and the hands because you're concentrating more on the main body and on the legs. But do make a point of going over uh, the feet, the hands and arms down to the elbow make sure that you haven't overlooked them and they're not excessively unpainted. Now that's achieved an overall basic coating and now I want to pass on to the shading which will bring it all together. I'm now um, using the deeper tone of paint to go around those areas that would naturally be shaded from overhead lighting. So the particularly underneath here where the left leg is raised, that part of the leg would be in deeper shadow than let's say that leg which is straight up and down. So you can concentrate a little more colour on that by 
correct application to the underside of the leg um, and where the muscle of the uh, calf uh, it is uh, more rounded at the top and that would catch the light so you need to be very light on that part but here where it starts to become concave then you need to add some shadow colour so that it naturally builds up into an overall skin tone with sculpture. In the areas where uh, the lighting is naturally shaded uh, you need to get in and particularly where there is an area of special shadow such as under the edge of the garment. Now an airbrush may have difficulty getting in under it because it would tend to settle on flatter areas either side. Um, so you do need to pay particular attention around the edges of clothing and wherever there is a natural crease you need to concentrate on uh, protruding objects such as the uh, scapula uh, that is emerging through the skin, the shoulder blade and to emphasize the shading of it by airbrushing very delicately underneath it and vary the angle slightly as well and then go around the edges of the clothing darkening in particular where the skin disappears underneath the cloth now do not uh, it doesn't matter that you are going over the clothing the important thing is to get a smooth gradation just on the edge make a if you like seek to make a little dark line just on the edge of the cloth going onto the skin the best way to do this is perhaps to target uh, the point of impact about um, a sixteenth of an inch in from the edge of the cloth and allow the natural overspray to come back onto the skin over the edge of the cloth. Go in under the chin, and you can fire an upward burst over the face, which will catch the sculpturing of the nose and lip. Do the same for the edge of the hairline, where the forehead and the hair meet. Just go over the edge of the hair, allowing just a little deeper uh, overspray to fall onto the edge of the forehead. Again, it doesn't matter if you're, you appear to be painting the hair with flesh colour because we can remove that very easily. Also, don't forget the other shoulder blade and where uh, the middle of the back occurs, just put a, a little shading to emphasise uh, the area of the spine, not forgetting that the cloth goes all round the figure so you need to get under the edge of the cloth everywhere the cloth occurs. I'm going to take just a minute amount of cadmium red and mix it in to the standard skin tone. Do it a tiny tiny amount at a time so that you have complete control over the difference you're making to the colours and you'll see that this is becoming significantly more rosy in its colour than the original skin tone was. Using just a small amount of that, we can touch in some parts of the anatomy which are a little more pink. And here, just a pink shading on the bottom or buttocks can look effective. On the soles of the feet and in particular around the toes and around the heel. Uh, on the hands and fingers, particularly the back of the knuckles 
and on the palm of the hand, uh, the cheeks, knees, and the back of the knees, and also on the back of the elbow. It's almost anywhere where the skin is tight against the bone, because it then reveals more of the blood vessels through the skin. Here you can now see a toning from pink to shaded to light tone on top of the instep. The sole of the foot is a little pinker, backs of the elbows, and that has a much more real appearance than if it simply had been sprayed with a monotone. The next really useful bonus that using oil paint can give is actually removing parts that you have painted on that you no longer want. For ease of smooth air brushing result, I've suggested that you paint the whole figure as if she was completely unclothed. And where of course you don't want skin tone is on the garment that she's wearing or on the uh, surfaces of the hair, notably the upper surface of the hair. Quite simply, the paint will remain uncured now for probably another day or two days, which gives you ample time to come back to this task. But to achieve it, you need to use a thinner applied with a hand brush, and you need to wipe off the paint you don't want, taking care not, of course, to accidentally get it on the parts that you do want. Using ordinary white spirit for this task, it's important not to use a more aggressive solvent like xylene or cellulose, and then using an accurate, well-pointed brush, remove the oil paint by painting carefully up to the edge of the garment and then drying the brush. You do this in progressive stages but you can see that what is happening now is that the paint that was there is being removed leaving the colour of the underpainting only visible to view. I think this graphically shows the effect of the system. You have now a skin tone which gets progressively deeper as it turns into shadow going underneath the edge of the garment. You then have uh, the bright white restored to the highlight where it comes up over the skin. In essence, it's achieved the effect of having the whole lot masked off without having to go to the tedious nuisance of actually making complex masking uh, and then only spraying the skin tone and then peeling off the mask from the garment. Uh, the same principle applies to hair, and you can see that I'm taking the brush across the top of the hairline. Don't worry about uh, the scalp colour showing underneath, because that's quite useful at the edge of the hair, because when you paint the hair on the top, it blends naturally into the colour of the skin on the face. When you're satisfied with the end result, you need to put this figure somewhere safe so that the oil paint can cure. Well, there you see the application of a basic skin tone on which you can now, when it has cured fully in two days' time or so, you can go back with a very detailed hand brush just to detail the eyes and the other small anatomical details, uh, shading actually between the toes, uh, and you can then do all that without having to worry about the excellence of the blending on the skin. All of that has been done, and in effectively a matter of minutes. Whereas had you tried to do this with a hand brush throughout, it would have taken very considerably longer to get the same result. Here's an interesting little presentation piece by Present Arms of a Colt Navy revolver, period of the American Civil War, its holster, ammunition, pouch and belt. For this present purpose I plan to demonstrate uh, doing a blued finish on the steel barrel and case hardening colours on the action and cylinder. Now, just to ensure that everything is free of any fingerprints or grease. Um, I recommend that you use alcohol just to wash it 
and use a brush just to paint over it to make sure that there are no untoward oily bits. With a lint-free cloth just to soak up the alcohol and just a little drying off. The airbrush will clear the alcohol away so that there are no marks. Now we're ready to put the base coat down, which will be high grade, high gloss black. Uh, this is a base gloss black paint that Alclad use as an underpainting for a lot of their silver metallic finishes. And here it is already thinned to airbrush consistency. And so I do not need to actually decant it in order to thin it. And so I propose simply to load it straight into the airbrush and then give a nice even spray coating. Now to, to get a nice gloss you do need to actually spray it wet. So rather than build up a thin surface, because that tends to dry very flat and matte, you need to spray quite generously so that it begins to get a wet surface you must not overdo this and, and, and get uh, dribbles or runs. And so it's really quite delicate how to do it. But as soon as you can see a gloss surface appear, that's when to stop airbrushing that particular part. What a nice gloss black. Right, now that's just about fine. I'm going to leave it just a chance to dry and I'll do something else while it's drying. And now, whilst the undercoat black on the barrel is hardening, I'm going to try and do case hardening colours on the action and the cylinder. For this purpose, I'm going to use ink, and I have here two colours that I'm going to use. One is blue, and the other is brown. And I'm going to mix them with a little bit of Tamiya Clear Acrylic and some alcohol. And here I'm going to spray directly onto the polished white metal using the white metal itself as the underbase. And I need just a little piece of paper with a ragged edge, which I'm going to use as a random mask to get the hardening colours in a, in, a, in a random pattern. What I'm trying to achieve here is a variegated, almost fluid pattern of colour, which is the sort of random effect that you get with case hardening. Now it's a combination of colours, so I'm now going to vary it by changing colour and spraying another pattern with the brown. So that you end up with a mottled effect. Don't worry about going over the edges onto the frame um, because that can easily be removed with a little thinner because uh, in the on the real revolver uh, the frame here is very frequently made of brass, that and the trigger guard which contrasts nicely, of course, against the blued and case-hardened steel. If you look at case-hardening, it contains a great deal of varied colours. In fact, it would look rather good if I put a little green and yellow amongst it as well. Now, this yellow is relatively strong, so the very tiniest amount. And then finally, just a little touch of green. And to avoid any one colour dominating, it's probably best in the end to return to your original colours of blue and brown and then put a mixture of them together to give just a final overspray so it is not too garish.
I think that's about as far as I want to take it. What I will do is just clean up with a little cellulose thinners just around the edge of the frame. Now you'll notice that whereas this has now got the right colours in place, it has flattened the overall texture. In other words, it looks a little bit dull for a polished metal. Colour is there, texture isn't there. So this is where the final touch comes in on the case hardening by the use of a little varnish just on top of it to give you that metallic reflectivity. Um, whenever you do metal uh, you do need a final overcoat of a very reflective varnish and then it will look like metal rather than simply a nicely painted object. You have to have a surface texture that is representative of the material. I'm going to put that on there to dry. I think you can see it has now restored the metallic appearance uh, to the cylinder. Now we can go back to the barrel uh, which is now high gloss finished in black and this is where the ability to paint spray with some interference colours comes into its own. Some pearl automotive paint, it's a cellulose based paint, but it's designed to give a metallic blue on either a white or a black undercoat. In a very thin solution it has the most remarkable effect. Right, now um, I'm going to go very gently doing this and hopefully you will see the transformation occur. Where it was black, it has now got that subtle metallic blue that you get with very nicely applied blued steel. You can see the hexagonal barrel catches the light as you turn it. And there we have one Colt revolver uh, with a blued barrel and hardening colours on the action. Rather a, an unusual and rather advanced airbrush technique is the creation of uh, natural feathers which are particularly useful for doing North American Indian subjects where they're worn as part of their dress. All sorts of materials have been used including silk, of course there's traditionally the sculptured feathers which of course are totally opaque. There is nothing that quite works like a real feather and this is where an airbrush is a vital component to the exercise because you cannot do this exercise with a paintbrush. The moment that you put paint from a brush onto a feather it will immediately capillary up the fronds of the feather and ruin it. And the moment that you touch it on you see what happens. It goes up the brush that no matter how little you apply uh, the trick here is to use an airbrush because of the wafer-thin particles of paint which are almost dry when they hit the feather and therefore the markings can be controlled. And to do it you must make up a simple mask. I've used here masking made from the lead sheet that came from the top of a wine bottle and I've simply sliced out strips and bands roughly comparable to the markings that I want to make. What I'm going to do is to place the feather onto a background so that I can trap it in the position I want and I'm going to put the mask over the top. Lightly airbrush through the mask and when I lift it off, you'll see that it has got randomly applied stripes which are approaching, that's an original, any shapes can be used. This happens to be an aperture that I've made up using some etch brass fronds of bracken and that will produce some bird-like markings as you will see. Usually the tip of the feather is irregularly solid. Here I'm going to just use a portion of this mask with just 
the, the tip showing, but with a see that irregular tooth uh, along the top edge. Well, if I use that as a mask here, put some colour on, and then remove the mask, you'll see that it has made a nice shape uh, without getting that rather difficult spreading effect that you have with a wet brush. Remember to go around to the other side and reverse the mask so it now does the same thing but in the reverse direction to get a density of colour. And next we need to have some less regular markings up and down the shaft. Now an eagle feather is not totally coloured. The tip is coloured of the immature golden eagle, but the other markings are rather more random and are blotchy, and to try and randomise it, it may be best to just do a few minor passes using another form of mask. Frequently the Indian tribes used to mark feathers with different colours as a code for indicating what coup they had achieved. First coup, second coup, third coup, that kind of thing. By using a mask you can put onto a feather a geometric shape which you could not achieve with a paintbrush alone. Uh, here is again a simple lead sheet mask. Uh, this has got two stripes on it and I can demonstrate this just as easily. But if you have uh, the stripes that come only part way across the feather, which was used in some cases, then you simply position your mask so that the cut-off point is halfway across. For the next part of this uh, presentation, I'm going to produce the masking frisket required to produce the camouflage pattern and the markings and some D-Day stripes on the upper surfaces of this model Mosquito. I should add, for the benefit of those who are eagle-eyed, you can see this is a very poor quality model. It is an old test bed that I rescued from someone who is using it as a toy. Now, to produce the necessary mat or masking shapes, you have to scale them. I found a rather a good reference to the standard government pattern for the mosquito, and it has to the same scale the roundels that were used at the time. By taking a measurement from wingtip to wingtip, I see that it is exactly 149 millimetres and the aircraft has a measurement across the wingtips at the same point of 225 millimetres. And with those figures, I now use a simple calculation. If I take 225 millimetres and I divide by 149 millimetres uh, multiplied by 100, I end up within a, a few decimal points of 151%. If I now take this plan to a photocopier and I copy it at 151%, it will produce a plan which is exactly the correct size for the wingspan. And here is the finished scale up and you'll see that this now is at the correct dimensions for the model. Now you'll see here that the camouflage pattern is shown shaded where the area is dark green and unshaded where it is grey. I recommend that you label each of these areas so that when they're cut out you can still identify which portion that you've got rather than have to make up a jigsaw every time. For that reason it's sensible to do two of these plans, just roll off two copies, one of which you will need to use to cut out, and the other you need as your master plan. Uh, that enables the camouflage pattern to be followed, so that I can then find all the component parts which will correspond with the ones on my master copy. 
This is necessary because they do get a little jumbled up when you're using them. By labelling them you will never have a problem as to who, which bit goes at which location. I have also made the necessary Type B roundel for the top wings using a new masking material, Ultra Mask. For this purpose I use a cutting head on a pump compass by measuring exactly on the centre of a roundel to its outer edge and then simply spin the cutter around the central point. As the blade cuts the material, air penetrates it just around the edge. You can then remove that. And here is a perfectly cut roundel for the exterior, cut to size, cut to scale, and ready to use as a mask. There it is in position on our plan. I've placed a little dot in pencil exactly where the centre of the roundel should be. And by placing the centre spot in position directly over that, the little dot registers with the paint spot and you can press it into position. And then the next part of the roundel you can fit perfectly by registering it with the centre spot. You might have to do this once or twice to get it perfectly in position, but it will go. There we are. Just press it flat with the back of your nail. And then finally, I'm going to use the patch from where I took the roundel. And that I also place in register. So that is now perfectly centred. And all of the edges of the adhesive are matching and lining up one with another. I'm going to start with the red spot in the centre of the roundel. And... Um, here I'm going to gently remove the masking that I first put on to find the centre point. Now this you need to keep and conserve carefully. So I'm going to put it onto a little bit of backing paper. Next, using a brick red, which is the correct colour for the MOD identification colour during the war, load the airbrush as squarely as possible and just apply a little at a time. Make sure you do the edges thoroughly. And then transferring to the other round bit. Uh, what you need to do is just pick up the edge of the mask so that you can then peel it slowly back and carefully without distorting it. Just pull it away once they're in position, just tamp them down with light pressure to make sure that they're all nicely adhering all round. Right, next then we load with blue, and this is the correct British standard dull identification blue used in this period of the war. Put some thinner with it. What I'm going to do now is to put these maskings back in position. Now the next part of the exercise involves removing the outer part. I don't really want to spoil the white, and so what I'm going to do is to clean away these small particles here. And that restores the, the white and removes any trace of overspray. Now next, I need to put on uh, D-Day stripes. Now on the Mosquito they're 24 inch width and by using some of this masking tape uh, sticking it to a piece of card and then slicing up the card you can get some nice parallel edges particularly if you have access to a guillotine. Now the D-Day stripes start immediately outboard of the wing flap and engine nacelle. Here is an illustration of where they should go just by placing one piece of tape so the other piece of tape runs exactly along the side is a way of keeping your D-Day stripes perfectly parallel. I've now got five D-Day stripes masked. They're all the same width and the, the beauty of it is that they have acted as spacers one for the other with parallel sides. What I'm now going to do is to remove every other one because those will be the black stripes. Uh, with black in the brush, nice even strokes. Uh, 
and that would be perfectly adequate for the black part of the D-Day stripe. What I'm going to do now is to put the masks back into position over the black. The next part is where we spray with the upper surface grey. It's easier to work with a lighter colour and go on to your darker colour as the overall camouflage. And I can now just simply paint that overall. When you spray, direct the spray just a little over the outer edge of the masking rather than towards it to avoid lifting it. Now the port wing I'm not troubling to do any D-Day stripes on. Uh, it has the roundel in position so this would be what it looks like at any other time other than D-Day. Here is the mask that I've cut and you'll see it's the lighter portion which means it's the bit that'll end up grey after I have sprayed green. By matching the position of this mask to its exact position on the plan. What I'm going to do is move my fingers about to keep the edge of the mask in register a little bit above the grey paint underneath and by spraying obliquely across the top that way towards the mask you get a, a firm but a slightly soft edge which accurately reproduces the matte patterns that they used to use to produce the same markings on the ocean aeroplanes. This is a slightly heavy gauge paper and it has enough depth that it slightly softens the edge when you shoot your masking spray across from the outside to the inside of where you are painting. I need to do this portion but I'm only going to do the near edge because I want to find the mask for portion K to do the outer edge of the mask. So just working inwards and next when I lift the mask off you will see that it has got an outline camouflage pattern. For the moment it matters not that there is a little bit of damage to the paint surface. We can correct that with no difficulty later on. Having sprayed inwards from both edges of the mask, what I'm now doing is just filling in the middle of them, taking care not to overspray out of the pattern. And that just fills in the thin bit that's in the middle. And then I'll just change colours back to the grey to touch in those parts that were slightly damaged. Now this, this illustrates the advantage of keeping the other part that you didn't use as a mask because what you can do is remove that part and the part that's been damaged is right along the edge of the mask. So what I've got to do is just place that mask in position and spray the, the grey edge that you want. That's it. Perfectly restored. That'll give you uh, an idea of the sort of thing I'm seeking to achieve. Uh, it now remains for me to remove all this masking to see what we've got. And I hope it will all work. There may be very small bits that need just a little touch up, but that's easily done. The D-Day stripes. What I have here is simply a piece of plastic, polystyrene plastic card. With a, a scribing tool, I've scribed some parallel lines and I've made a couple of verticals to represent the end of planks and then I've tapped in with a punch the equivalent of some nails in the end of the planks. And what I'm now going to show is one method of making it look realistically like wood. Now, in the first place, I'm going to take some raw umber paint 
and with white spirit only I'm going to dilute two colours into a mix and I'm purposely using white spirit. If I was to use a xylene or alternatively a stronger solvent it would actually etch the plastic. Now this does not have to be done with enormous precision. Now whilst that oil paint is still relatively wet, I'm going to wipe it off um, so that what you have is a series of striations along the plank. Now that's fine for one type of wood, it's very much a, a bleached looking wood and the dark in between the planks emphasises where the plank edges are. I can add a little more detail to the wood grain by simply using torn greaseproof paper and by placing it on the wood and then spraying along the near edge and then moving the wood grain just a few degrees and spraying it again then moving the paper just a few degrees once more spraying along the edge and after a while moving it a further degree or two and then moving it a little the other way proceeding at random with it, plus a little more wiping off. You can create a wood grain effect and you can enhance it with the use of a bristle brush. With nothing on it, it's just plain bristle. But you can just simply mark in a wood grain effect, which actually looks quite effective, uh, particularly if you play around with the colours. Now what I'm going to do is just to overspray this generally and to show you what can be achieved with the application of the bristle brush technique in a rather more sustained way. And it's as well when doing this to bear in mind that some of these planks will be of slightly different colour. So if one uses just the edge of a sheet of paper as a mask, What we can do is to vary the colour of that particular plank. And don't worry if you get a if you accidentally touch it, that will add more to the variety of the wood. And you can take it to any extent, any degree of Let's see if we can do a little knot here and there. And it, this is working because the, the paint is going on so thinly, the scraping effect of an ordinary bristle brush is cutting through and revealing some of the background. We mix up a little cinema green and we have some Payne's grey. We can modify the colours, make it look a little more like old wood, a little more greyed and weathered. You can, you can even put in some saw cutting, so it looks like a circular saw has been cutting the wood through. And then finally with a little cinnabar green paint. You can just add that little touch of moss at the bottom where it tends to be a little more damp near the ground and just go back to enhance it. A little brass brush. It 
a little gun metal paint I just touch it in to where the nails or screws are holding the planks on and I hope you can see there that you've got some sort of a going effort of doing planking which would be quite useful if you're doing a log cabin or a building using a lot of timber. Well I've certainly learned a lot from Jeff and I'm sure you have too so please join me again for further programs in the Expert Model Craft series. And don't forget the DVD extras. Uh, may I introduce you uh, to the airbrush in its varying forms. Uh, at its simplest is the single action airbrush which is very simply a means of atomizing any kind of fluid material in the collecting cup and pressure, uh, compressed air, is uh, passed through it picking up paint on the way from the cup because of the venturi effect of dragging out the paint particles with the airflow. Uh, it's controlled by simply pressing the release valve which can be manipulated to some degree but that is the only control that you have. You can vary the pressure and you can vary only the flow and you have not got anything like the sophistication that you have and the control that you have with a double action airbrush. Uh, the industry standard uh, for the uh, double action airbrush has for many years been the DeVilbis Super 63. Uh, it's at least 40 years old. It is a very simple airbrush in its concept and I will be demonstrating the various ways of cleaning all of these airbrushes a little later. Uh, this brings me to the Rolls-Royce end of the present airbrush scene. This is an Iwata HPBH and it has so many sophisticated uh, devices associated with it. It is precision made and it is uh, double action as you can see from the familiar button and stirrup system. It has uh, a modest fixed air cup but there are other models which have side cups. It has a sophisticated travel uh, micrometer device at the end and even in addition to that uh, if you have a fixed airflow you have even a little tweaking valve at the front which can diminish or enlarge the amount of the airflow that you're actually getting to fine-tune it. It is without doubt the most sophisticated airbrush that I've used and uh, is of great appeal because it is currently in issue and all the spares are readily available. Of vital importance to any airbrushing is the ability to clean thoroughly the airbrush at the end of your session or even if you get a blockage part way through. And sadly, most of the airbrush manufacturers do not give you instruction how to do it efficiently or even how to do it at all. Such instructions that you do get from airbrush manufacturers is to remove the needle by withdrawing it out of the back of the airbrush. But I'm going to actually suggest to you that you do the very opposite and that you withdraw the needle from the front of the airbrush to avoid damage to the very, very delicate tip. And to do that, you need to withdraw the needle part way so that the point is out of harm's way. Undo the nozzle, and then you can pass the needle out through the front, out of harm's way completely. Now, 
In order to reassemble, you need to reverse that process, but the needle has got a square end at the back. And my advice is that firstly, before you do anything else, you grind off that point to taper it and put a little bit of a point on it so that it can negotiate its way back through the working parts with ease. It will find its own centre that way. It's easily accomplished with a file and some wet and dry. But once you've done that, it will then pass through the airbrush working parts absolutely easily and it will emerge out of the other end just as it would have done with the square end but it will be able to slip through the stirrup and the seals much more easily. I've been using this Iwata airbrush and it is uh, dirty, it's got paint in it and it has paint in the nozzle and um, although it still flows I do want uh, to totally clean it as if I was putting it away at the end of the day. This is how to disassemble your Iwata in order to accomplish this target. You first of all undo the rear section and this now reveals the needle. Undo the locking nut and withdraw the needle at least half an inch to ensure that the delicate point is out of harm's way when we remove the end cap. Having done that, we can now unscrew the end cap, do this very carefully, and that reveals this tiny nozzle. Now Iwata provide in their box that comes with the airbrush a special spanner, and there are flats on either side of the nozzle, and this spanner is a precise fit. So move it into position and with great care, once it's exactly right, loosen the nozzle. The next piece of equipment that I'm going to recommend that you obtain is the plastic tube from a big ballpoint pen and it is just the right diameter to fit over the end of the nozzle. You can then unscrew the nozzle which has got very delicate threads and then you can remove it under control without any danger of dropping it. The next stage is then to move the needle forward so it comes out of the front. The airbrush can then be flushed through with ordinary uh, cellulose thinners and blown through and that will clean the cup and the delivery tube now the nozzle can be carefully removed and this is where extreme care is necessary. You don't want to drop this. And again with cellulose thinners clean the exterior. Any paint off it that has collected around it. Probably this has now got a blockage within that tiny cone. The best way uh, to clear that blockage is to use one of these airbrush cleaning products. This has a delivery tube of actually smaller diameter than the, the big biro tube that I've used. What I'm going to do is to feed the nozzle tightly into the end of the tube. Press the button and that will blast in the opposite direction. And there you see the blockage, the build-up of particles that was blocking the nozzle. It will inevitably happen that if you have a tapered cone and it's blocked, if you blast it out through the other way, using no more than this uh, to do it, then it will clear it like a wedge being pushed in the opposite direction. And you should be able to see uh, clear through it into the wide blue yonder beyond. If you need to penetrate the nozzle at all, use only the fibres of a rigger or a lining brush. This has very, very long, slim, pencil-like hairs and can be used just to as well clean it. And you, you can push individual hairs through the nozzle to ensure that it is fully cleared. Under no circumstances push any steel or hard wire through the nozzle with the sole exception of the very finest copper wire, if you absolutely have to as a council of last resort. 
Now to reassemble uh, the Iwata you have to do it in this sequence. Firstly the needle. Using some airbrush cleaner moisten a patch on your cleaning cloth. Draw this backwards. Clean it of all paint. Use a lubricant or failing that and somewhat unhygienically you could even use the oil from the side of your nose and just wipe that onto the airbrush. That's another way, uh, perhaps rather more traditional. And then carefully and taking particular care not to bump the point, you pass the pointed base of our needle through the airbrush until it emerges at the end and then you pull it until you can clearly see that the point is well withdrawn out of harm's way. Next comes the replacement of the nozzle and here again extreme care is required. We place the big biro tube over the front and press it so that it is held firmly. Bring the tube and the threads on the nozzle into battery and very gently revolve them until the threads are quite clearly taking up because you do not want to cross the threads under any circumstances. Once you've got the airbrush top fully started then you can reapply your spanner and do the final tightening but do not give it this any more than just a very slight push to lock it into position. Do not apply any force at all on that spanner or you will strip the threads. You need it just a little bit more locked than slack. Pull it up then you will damage the airbrush. Having cleaned the nozzle section with a little cellulose thinners, reassemble them and then taking care uh, not to touch the nozzle replace that in position and that should again only be finger tight. Now we turn once more to the needle and we press forward firmly and you can just revolve it slightly to make sure it's properly seated and keeping a little pressure on the back tighten the locking nut. You can then try and see that when you move the stirrup back it will also move this unit with it. Finally you replace the rear part of the airbrush ensuring that the end of the needle fits into the aperture there because this is an additional control. Um, it has a micrometer uh, control at the end of it which governs how much out of battery the sharp point of the needle may go. Now finally, having got it all back into assembled condition, I like to take a, a tissue or a cloth and moisten it with cellulose thinners and just clean any drip uh, around the exterior so as to leave it in as new condition. Now for users of the Devilbis equipment, the cleaning system is as follows. First of all, you remove the barrel and it has a locking nut similar to the uh, Iwata so unlock that, withdraw the needle out of harm's way. Then you go to the other end to the nozzle end and you carefully undo that revealing a brass nozzle. Sometimes this actually comes out locked into the cap but that doesn't matter just simply carefully pull them apart. The next part that you remove is critical. Although much larger than the Iwata. This brass turned nozzle is incredibly delicate and it has seated onto the base of it a neoprene washer and of all things it's this washer that causes more trouble than anything else because it's so easy to lose. So it helps to have a number of spares which you can still get of this tiny little component but it is really very important to preserve that very carefully. Having removed the nozzles, you may then slide the needle out front ways and pull it out. Each of these components may now be cleaned very thoroughly and as with the Iwata, the final nozzle cap does come apart. 
Importantly, it is this part which needs the most care and attention. And again, you may only approach it using the bristles of a fine brush to penetrate within it. And you can actually clear a blockage by passing the bristles through, or just two or three of them, so you can see them coming out of the other end. To reassemble, firstly the needle, and once more lubricate the needle very gently, not very much is needed, so that when you pass it through the body it will slide nicely through all the work until it emerges at the other end. Pull it so that you can see the point, you can see through here, that the point is now quite clearly out of the way of the nose. And then, and this is the tricky part, you need to push that little rubber grommet onto the shoulders at the base of the nozzle. Make sure it's well seated. And now you can see that that little washer, which forms a seal, is firmly in position. You can see the point now of withdrawing the point of the needle way out of reach so it isn't banged whilst you're trying to seat this part. You can feel when it reaches the bulkhead against which it is pressed, and then when you replace the nose cap, it screws down and it tightens the nozzle and the seal. Do it finger tight. You can then set up the needle again by pushing it forward into position and revolving it. Now the Devilbis has got uh, a controlling ring, which as you can see it roll, it will move the button backwards and forwards. The trick is now to rotate it one quarter turn, and that you will see brings the button back just a bit, and then placing a little pressure on the back of the needle, you lock the nut, and then you unscrew it that quarter turn. And the effect of that means that when you press the air on and you start to withdraw the button, the paint comes on after a brief second rather than immediate and that can uh, be useful to avoid spattering. And then replace the handle and there we have it in absolutely perfect A1 condition to start work again. Uh, here are a couple of quick tips for people who use the Aztec airbrush and good things that I've discovered about cleaning them. In the first place, of course, they do have a removable colour cup and they have a removable nozzle. Let us assume that this nozzle is dirty and that colour cup is dirty. Simply take them out of the airbrush and put in a clean high flow nozzle and a clean large colour cup. Put cellulose thinners in here and then you're ready to clean the rest of your equipment. Firstly, Disassemble the dirty head. Do this by easing backwards and forwards whilst holding the white component. So withdraw it and then at the back is a spring-loaded pin. If you turn the spring-loaded pin anti-clockwise that will tighten the pin and allow it to slide out. Now that pin and this device here and the inside you have to imagine you've got paint on them. Uh, the cup comes apart simply by pulling it apart and you can clean the worst off using a tissue and a tissue to remove it inside. This is where the same airbrush body but using uh, cellulose thinners comes into its own because you can now pressure hose the dirty components using a high pressure spray with cellulose thinners. Best if you do this on a tissue so the overspray and the dirty paint being flushed off is absorbed on the tissue. You can do the same thing with the next component, including spraying up inside it uh, until it's all fully clean, and similarly with the nozzle. Exactly the same, pressure spray the other components, the colour cup, including the delivery tube, both inside and out, and in no time those will be clinically clean. Uh, to reassemble uh, you take the pin with the spring load on it and insert that into the nozzle and turn it so that it is in fully in battery once more. You then take the outer nozzle and because this has got wings, it's got flutes which uh, catch in the right place, you simply turn it until they slot into position and then press it firmly home. 
There are lots of paint materials that work through an airbrush equally well. They use different media, some are acrylic, others are enamel based, and various products that are available in Europe will work every bit as well as various products that are available in the United States, North America. The American market will be familiar with test ores and flow quill. Uh, there are many who used to swear by Aeromaster paints until they went out of production, but in fact they are produced by flow quill, uh, who continue in production even now. There are various British paints that are widely available in the United States. Hallant's Extra Colour and Extra Acrylics, the uh, products of White Ensign, which are enamels uh, covering all of the naval colours and a lot of the Air Force colours in depth, are now widely available. The colours that are truly internationally available, like Tamiya, Life Colour and SNJ, Spray Metal and in particular Alclad, really are so generally available worldwide that there should be no difficulty in accessing any particular paint type. The most useful single piece of household palette that I can persuade you to adopt is the ordinary bathroom tile. They come in two sizes. If anything, this larger one is more practical. Uh, but for mixing um, colours, if you're hand brushing or even if you're wanting to uh, judge the colour of uh, a material, uh, it's worth having a tile with a white or light grey background so you can see uh, exactly how it would be um, coloured over a base uh, on your finished model. A flat tile is especially valuable for getting exactly the right tone if you're using oil paints because you can spread and mix the colours until it's absolutely exactly the colour you want before you start to airbrush with it. Absolutely vital to airbrush use is to have a palette which will contain mixing amounts of uh, paint, paint to which thinner is added, in a sufficient quantity for it to be used for airbrush application. You don't want to run out of uh, mixed paint halfway through the job and then to remix it only to get the consistency different or the tone or colour different. So one of these inexpensive uh, metal uh, wells has got enough to keep you going for most airbrush projects before you have to stop and then clean them out. Uh, the only disadvantage with it is that it is relatively light and if you have it full of paint and then you put uh, inadvertently some heavy object on it, it can do that and then you get all of the paint all over you and all over the desk. The solution to the problem is quite simply to use a ceramic equivalent of the tin uh, tray, but this is so heavy that it will resist any kind of tipping and it's difficult to move. Now this is available from any art shop. Uh, it's standard equipment and it's absolutely vitally useful because you can clean it absolutely pristine, clinically clean every time because the non-porous ceramic surface, uh, vitreous surface, is proof against any kind of solvent that you might have to apply. The vital thing with all airbrush work is to thin the paint about to the consistency of milk. Not uh, cream, a single cream you might get away with if it's a very heavy coating you want, but mostly about the consistency of milk is about right, whether it is a water-based or a spirit-based paint. The very best formula is about the consistency of milk, and you do that by uh, simply adding suitable amounts of uh, the appropriate thinner to the paint and uh, this should all be carried out in your palette and never, ever 
in the paint cup of the airbrush itself. I'm transferring the paint into the palette, building up the quantity that I need for the job in hand. This is a matter of judgment and you'll be able to gauge this with experience of doing uh, a lot of work. Uh, I'm going to use just a drop of their solvent and a drop of water. So using um, a, an eyedropper, charge it, transfer to the palette and you can control precisely the number of drops that you're going to use. I'm next going to work that around to make sure that it is evenly mixed and I see from this that it is still rather thick. It is rather more in the nature of cream rather than milk as you will see. And so I'm going to further dilute it with a few drops of water. Now that is much more the sort of consistency that we're seeking. It flows rather better. It could even do with just another drop or two of water. There we are. And that's about the right thickness so that when it drains down the edge of the well, it leaves a coating of colour, but not necessarily a very thick one. Uh, don't worry about any amounts that um, overspill, you can clean those all up later. But that will give you some idea of the sort of consistency, and you can see by just painting some around the edge that it will then start to sink down, that you've got the consistency around about correct. Uh, one thing I must explain is do not panic if you make a mistake in finishing any of the work that you're doing. The airbrush sprays such thin coats of paint, it's microns thin, and so you can always go back and correct what you've done. Usually if you're using a mask by using the other bit of the mask that you're not utilising putting it back and then spraying in the opposite colour around the edge. Now I noticed that one or two small oversprays occurred, possibly because of the curvature of the wing lifting up some of the masking, when I was masking the roundels on the mosquito. And so what I've done is simply to replace the bits I did not use and then spray the opposite colour. Now in doing this corrective work uh, I do recommend that you uh, remember that if you're spraying, let's say, the red for the centre of the roundel, it will tend to drift sideways, and so using uh, temporary masking, just put it so that the rest of the aeroplane, or the tank, or ship, or whatever you're doing, is actually just protected from any side spray from a contrasting colour. Post it with a slightly with an adhesive edge is an ideal material for this because it's low tack and it stays in position when you're spraying. I've now re-sprayed the centre of the roundel there and on this one the red was a little smudged and so I've re-sprayed the blue here. These can now be removed in order to see, I hope, the corrected and finished versions. Now remember, when you remove masking, do it so that it pulls at a flat angle against the edge. And again, here. And then finally, Just lift the edge and with tweezers
the corrections are now complete and each roundel is now perfect and in exactly the correct colours. Any alterations or corrections can be made easily that way. It is better to do it with remasking than to attempt to do it with a hand brush. Hand brushes tend to make a difference in the surface shine that you get and you certainly can't do a uniform straight edge. It is much easier, for instance, to go back in and simply mask an edge and then overspray any um, loose errors that have occurred. I first started modelling when I was a kid at school, I suppose I would have been about 11 or 12. Um, and about that time the very first Airfix kit came out. It was in British old money, uh, two shillings in a polythene bag available from Woolworths. Um, I uh, have had a passion for modelling aircraft which I have never grown out of ever since. My father was in the aviation industry as an aero engineer and I had masses of access when I was a small boy uh, to enjoy all of the fun of getting into aircraft cockpits um, on interesting World War II stuff when he used to be with flight refuelling uh, in Dorset doing experimental work and they used to use a lot of uh, X forces Lancasters and uh, Lincolns and Mosquitoes that sort of thing and then subsequently when he became involved in the uh, civil airline industry and he was chief engineer to several airlines um, I used to have the advantage of being able to get true crew training flights um, where I could do circuits and bumps and uh, I was just simply absolutely mad about aeroplanes. Now my father was well aware of the risks of the aviation industry as a profession. Uh, it had grown like a mushroom after World War II with the Berlin airlift um, and a lot of small um, aviation companies sprang up and he could see that it wasn't going to last. There was a limit to everything. And so he did everything he could to discourage me from going into um, either the Royal Air Force or into aviation. Um, I thwarted him to the degree that I was able to make models of them instead. I sort of sublimated uh, my passion for being a frustrated uh, pilot by actually making models of the things I, I, I really loved. Looking back, uh, what made me interested in modelling as a hobby, I think came from a very early age. I know that my association with aircraft through my father drew me to making models of aeroplanes, but what made me interested in modelling in the very first place was, I'm looking back on it, when I was about nine, we used to visit my uncle uh, who used to be um, a serving soldier in the North African campaign and uh, he was with the 10th Hussars um, and was at most of the major battles in North Africa. He was commander of a Crusader III and made uh, a marvellous model of that tank in brass to about, oh, uh, it'd be about 1 20th scale. And that model used to come out at my insistence when we paid him a family visit, as I was just fascinated by it. Uh, during the 1970s, I had got about as far as I could get with hand brushing of the aeroplane models that I so enjoyed. And I'd heard about airbrushes. Um, I knew that uh, it was relatively rare to find them. Um, in fact, I did manage to uh, obtain one, this was in 1970, from De Vilbis, and their top range uh, model was the Super 63, which cost uh, £17.12 and sixpence back in those days. Uh, and with that, uh, I was able to experiment using enamels, uh, and developing different uh, techniques which I still use today 
but uh, which achieved a finish on model aircraft that surpassed anything that I could possibly have attempted with a hand brush. The, uh, the various materials that you can use uh, in an airbrush started to intrigue me. There are masses and masses of products that keep being invented by the art market during the course of year on year and I find I'm completely unable to resist any new materials to see if I can put it through an airbrush. Um, in, in the course of playing around with an airbrush and finding out what it will do uh, leads to experimenting with different kinds of paint materials and media. Um, I, I'm a, a painting artist as well as a model maker and so very many of the pigments and the materials that are used for fine art um, are adaptable to model making. And so that's really where it all started. Now since then there have been uh, masses of wonderful new materials and paints that have come from the art world and from uh, science and technology which have made uh, doing special effects even easier, even more exciting. And uh, to adapt them all to our purposes as model makers has been one of my great passions. Um, I'm constantly experimenting with different ideas and different uh, styles of using an airbrush. And all I can say is it's the most exciting journey that I think I've done and, and have, uh, have made in years. And there seems to be just no end to the tricks that you can pick up uh, by the uh, use of this exceptional tool uh, the single most useful item in a modeler's toolbox.